mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. So would you continue to sing with us this morning?
why don't you take a moment to say hi to those around you and then you may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, man. You guys know when I come up here, it has to be better than that, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. That's what we like to hear. Some people that are wide awake, some people that are glad to be here, and the joy of the Lord sitting with us, right? Well, I was struggling uh, with what I was going to talk to you about. I know what I want to talk to you about, but there are so many different avenues that I wanted to talk to you about it this morning before we go into the announcements and stuff. Uh, um, so I'm just going to talk, and whatever comes out, I hope you'll appreciate. But it might not be very logical because I was struggling with it. But my wife is uh, uh, really good at keeping in contact with a bunch of people. We, she does uh, a Christmas card uh, every year and sends it out to a lot of people, relatives in England and, and elsewhere. And... Uh, and uh, uh, and I, I'm going to give you a name, two names, Alan Rocio Williams. And many of you will remember them, um, and many of you won't, because that, it's a name from a long time ago, and uh, names from a long time ago, but Connie and I still c- kind of keep in touch with them. Alan Rocio Williams uh, met Herb Heidebrecht, and while he was on a mission trip into Ecuador, and many years ago, and Herb struck up a friendship with this American who was married to an Ecuadorian living in Ec- and they were living in Ecuador, and they decided God was putting on their hearts to build a camp in Ecuador. And they took it upon themselves with no sponsorship, no nothing, and they bought a bunch of land and, and through donations and stuff developed this camp. And somehow Herb met this family while he was down there. And... Uh, and they talked and they talked, and their, their daughter, Priscilla, who came to our church and stayed with Herb and Linda for uh, one summer, or one, one winter, she uh, finished her high school here. And then Herb inspired this church to go to Ecuador. And this church went four times with a group of men. I was able to go three times, James Clausen did it four times, and there were some really great men from the history of our church that went and donated money, and we were so thankful to them for that. Anyways, but so what I'm getting to, we had a lot of fun. That camp is still going strong. It was sold. Uh, Alan Rossi retired, and they're living in, uh, um, oh, in the States, Missouri, Joplin, Missouri. Thank you, dear. And uh, they have uh, almost this many grandchildren. Uh, uh, but they are having their 50th wedding anniversary, and they sent us in their Christmas card to invite us to their 50th wedding anniversary. And it's not till June of 2024, so it was to give us time to send people there. But I don't know if that's the truth or not, but uh, it was just a really great message uh, from them. Uh, good friends of ours, and they meant a, have meant a lot to a lot of the younger people that grew up in this church and a lot of us old people who still remember them. Um, And I just wanted to, uh, and it's part of the history of this church. We have sent people to to Belize. We sent people to Ecuador. We we sponsor people, and it's just such a great tribute to the church. And I just wanted to remember that this morning. And, uh, And now we'll go to the announcements. How's that? Uh, Mom's Time Out is starting again this weekend, this week, not this weekend, this week. And uh, uh, I'm the only guy who comes here uh, to Mom's Time Out. (laughs) 
my job is not with the moms, it's with the kids. So I, I, every couple of weeks, I get to come every two weeks and play with the kids. And uh, uh, really, there's not much better than me and we'll play with kids. And also, uh, uh, quilting is starting, and I know there's no men involved with that, but I'm sure the ladies would find you a job. There's always uh, some cutting and stuff to do that maybe you'd be qualified to do. Uh, also, on January 29th, from 2 to 4, there's a skating party over at the rink. And you are all invited, whether you can skate or not. And there'll be, at least there'll be hot chocolate. I can't believe there's not going to be more than hot chocolate, but that's all it says on my list. There'll be hot chocolate. Another thing that I'm supposed to highlight is the uh, one conference that's coming in February uh, 2nd to 3rd. In, in Calgary, and uh, if you go online, there's some really good details about the one conference. It's to spur on leadership within the church for the next period of time. And there is a sign-up list, and, uh, and we need to get hold of uh, Deanna. It, was it tomorrow? I think it was tomorrow, right? Uh, the early bird sign-up is by tomorrow. So that looked like when I went on the highlights, it looked really like a really good conference. So, that's all the main announcements I have for you, I hope. Um, so let's go to prayer. The prayer list, I'm going to give you the prayer list. I want you guys to pray about it, because I'm getting hoarse already. Um, um, first thing, thanks guys. John Cordell uh, passed away last night. Many of you know John. And, uh, and so we need to remember his family and extended family. Um, he was uh, still in the Three Hills, extent, not the extended care, but uh, in the, one of the lodges up there. Uh, we need to remember Donna Taves and Byron and the rest of the family as her mom passed away. Tyson Clausen, uh, uh, he hurt, broke his foot again. Uh, I don't think that's the first time. So, but he, he's on a mission trip, and so he's uh, trying to work and, and be with and still do it in his job. Lachlan Taves, he's in the United States with his mom and looking for healing and for some guidance as to what to do in these next steps with his Crohn's disease. Uh, our senior... Today is Luana Taves, living in Linden Lodge. Uh, Warren Peters is our student of the day, University of Alberta, and he's out at the Augusta campus in computer science. Uh, our ministry partners are Jeremy and Adrian in, uh, yeah, from Multiply in Thailand, and what, our um, other leaders are staff and board members and directors of Camp Evergreen, uh, specifically Courtney Armstrong today, uh, the ministry leaders within our church, and Scott, uh, as he brings us the sermon this morning, we're looking forward to that, and also we want to pray for the tithes and offerings. So let's just spend a, a few minutes in prayer this morning and, and give our... Uh, heart and minds to Jesus this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we have come to you with open arms, open hearts, and we just pray that you will be here with us. Yeah, your presence will be here with us. You'll give us joy. You'll give us calmness of heart so we can hear uh, the message this morning. We just ask you to pray for the tithes and offerings that uh, people are giving. Pray that uh, we will have wise stewards within our uh, congregation to dole out those funds. Pray for our, uh, our pastors as, uh, as they're away. Carrie's here, but Chris is not. We just uh, pray for them. Just, uh, Lord, there's many people who are sick and ill and we pray for them as well. Lord, your hand of healing can be up upon them. Lord, I also want to pray for uh, uh, Cordell's, John Cordell's family as uh, 
your hand of comfort will be on them at this time of their bereavement of their dad. And I want to pray for Byron and Donna as the passing of her mom as well. Lord, you are the great comforter. You are the great healer. And we are just so thankful that we can call you our Abba Father. Lord, we just want to give this service to you and our lives into your service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'd like to call all the kids up. It's a good thing I have a mic, hey? All right, I'd just like to pray for you guys. Father God, I just thank you so much for each of these little children. God, I thank you for uh, the joy that they bring uh, to, to church, the joy that they have for life and the enthusiasm that they have for life. God, I just ask that as they go to Sunday school now, Lord, that they would just be learning uh, about your love. Lord, that they would be experiencing your love and your goodness. And God, just as they learn stories and scripture, um, Jesus, that those things would just stick in their hearts and that they would just remember these things always. God, I thank you that you are close to them and I just ask your blessing upon them today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can head to your classes. Why don't you stand as we continue to worship through song this morning? <coughs>
Well, good morning, church. Uh, this morning, I just want to invite uh, and welcome our speaker, Scott Gillespie. He's with Action International Ministries. Um, if you recall, he was here in November sharing about his ministry, and uh, this morning he's coming to share the word with us. So let's uh, welcome up Scott. It's a pleasure to be here again. And what a wonderful day. Sunshiny, it's warm. I was out cross-country skiing yesterday. It was so nice to be out there and not have to be so bundled up. Um, and I didn't fall down this time. I actually stayed on my feet the whole trip, about a five-kilometer trip. Uh, of course, out of Acme, there's a really nice railway bed there. Great for walking and hiking and good for the, uh, the cross-country skiing. I waited all last year. I never got to go cross-country skiing because we never got enough snow at any one time to make it viable. But this year, with blowing snow over the railway bed and few little humps and bumps, I was able to enjoy my time. And as you know, it's great to see that the spirit of Christmas still lives on in the new year here. You know, I think that's a great thing. Sometimes we just hope Christmas is over. It's time to move on to well, in the stores, it's Valentine's Day. You know, you already have stuff out in the stores. But, you know, in the Philippines, they start celebrating Christmas in September. So they do a whole four months of celebrating Christmas. It's big there. And if you go into their mega malls, now these are malls that look, our malls look very small. They're three, four, five stories high of stores. And they'll be fully decorated with Christmas trees and Christmas music to celebrate the birth of Christ. And it's, I know my friends in the Philippines just love to um, celebrate Christmas there. As a matter of fact, we have friends, uh, former action missionaries, who actually have returned home from the field. They lived for 11 years in the Philippines, moved back to Manitoba to down to the Steinbach area where they're originally from. And uh, they're actually good Mennonites and that went over there. Um, so they decided they're going to take their family with their four grown boys, and they were all going to go to the Philippines for Christmas this year. But they never got there. They had to go through Vancouver, <laughs> you know, to fly out, you know, to Vancouver. And I don't know if, well, they never got to Vancouver, let alone to the Philippines. So they had to celebrate it in wintry, cold Manitoba. <clears throat> um, but anyway, you know, that's the way things go. Before I share some things from the Word, I just want to introduce myself a little bit more. I mean, lots of you maybe see my face. A few of you I know personally. Most of you do not know me. But just to get a little, little bit of a bio. Um, I, I grew up on the West Coast, Vancouver area. Uh, I came to faith in Christ when I was seven years old. And I want to give a shout out to Sunday school teachers. If any of you have been or are or plan to be a Sunday school teacher, go for it. It was through my Sunday school teacher after Sunday school one morning who helped me pray the prayer to accept Christ and make him my personal Lord and Savior. Sunday school teachers, um, DVBS workers, all those children's workers, you guys have a big responsibility and influence upon those young lives, even if you might not see it for years to come. So, be encouraged. And uh, if you have an opportunity to work with children, it's great to have a fellow go out for Mom's Day and work, play with the kids. I'd love to do that too. Because uh, I think with most guys, we're kids at heart. So, we work with, we play with kids and we're, we're right at home. Um, I was baptized at 10 years of age. Um, I got involved in my local church, even as a young person. I worked in our church library for a couple of years. I helped assist in the kindergarten class um, at our church. Involved in my youth group growing up in different ways. Not just attend, but I like to be involved and be part of what goes on. Went on to, to Bible College in Vancouver. And it was there, actually it was the year before I went to Bible College, I was going to UBC. I had decided that I wanted to get into a certain area of, of work once I graduated from high school. 
So I got accepted at UBC, but it was at UBC during my first semester that God tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're not supposed to be here. I don't want you here. So I kind of said, well, where do you want me? Because I didn't have a plan B. Well, the Lord said, I want you to go and do ministry for me full time. And there was an organization that I was familiar with through my family growing up called the Shantyman's Christian Association. I don't know how many have heard of them. They don't exist anymore. Um, but they worked right across Canada in rural, isolated areas of ministry, working in logging camps and mining camps. They had children's camps and all kinds of things going on. So I applied and got accepted after I did a, another year of Bible college at their request. So I did my second year at the same school. Then I moved to Manitoba, where I lived for 23 years. So I know what it's like to be in the cold and in the mosquitoes. They got cold half the year and mosquitoes the other, one, the other half of the year. But I did work amongst First Nations and Métis communities with the Shannimen um, for almost 20 years. And then the Lord tapped me on the shoulder again and said, okay, I want you to change your direction. And I said, okay, I, I love doing what I was doing and I was ready to do it the rest of my life. I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, you just wait. Sometimes God wants, tells us that there's a change coming, but he doesn't tell us right away what it is. We just have to be ready to go when it's time. So for two years, I waited for God to tell me specifically where I was supposed to go. So I continued to do what I was doing, work, working in the First Nations, camp ministry, youth ministry, family ministry. And then one day God says, I want you to go to Cuba. I went, Cuba? That's not even on my radar. I didn't know much about it, except what I heard in the news. But he says, I want you to go to Cuba, and I want you to teach them about camping. You've had 20 years of camp experience, and I want you to go, and I want you to teach them what I've taught you in that 20 years. So I did. So from 2000 until 2007, I went one to two times a year for two to three weeks at a time, working with different denominations in teaching them about camp ministry, running Bible camps. This was an area where Bible camps were being run in Cuba, but they had no training, no education in it. They just did it because they wanted to. So I was able to share what I had with them, things I'd learned, things that had been taught to me and passed abroad to them so they could expand and make their camping ministry more effective. One interesting one is when I went to visit the first time, I went to seven different camps in three weeks, and I asked them just a couple questions so I understood how their camping program worked. And one question was, do you let non-Christian kids come to your camp? I went, oh no, we don't do that, only Christian kids. Well, I said, why only Christian kids? Well, non-Christian kids, they don't know how to act properly. You know, they don't know the rules, they don't, you know, they could cause trouble. I said, you know what, in the camps I worked with with First Nations, 60 to 70 percent of the children who came to camp were non-Christian kids. They didn't come from Christian families. As a matter of fact, they never went to church and they wouldn't have been sent to a church by their families, but they would send them to a Christian Bible camp. And then they began, that, that got, got their wheels turning, and that's what God does. He uses us to help others to to maybe evaluate and assess what they're doing and maybe how they could do things differently. And from that, they started what they called evangelistic camps, where they would have Christian kids come, but the Christian kids could only come if they brought at least one non-Christian friend or family member with them to camp. And then they had different classes, sharing the gospel with the non-Christian kids, and then discipleship with the Christian kids. And it took off like crazy. Their churches, youth groups began to grow by leaps and bounds. They were able to get into homes that they never could have gotten into before. And so you could see how God was using me in ways that I didn't even imagine with what God had given me. Then after about 20 years uh, of ministry, I'd say with First Nations, I began to do this transition into overseas ministry, which was new to me. 
I had gone in 1996 and 97 to Russia um, to teach camping there through an organization out of Winnipeg. And that gave me my first taste of overseas. So then I began to look for a ministry that did overseas because the Shannonmen didn't do overseas ministry. They only did home ministry in Canada and the U.S. And that's when Action International Ministries came into play. I met some representatives from there. And I said, hey, by the way, I go to Cuba. Um, can I work, still go to Cuba and work with you guys? He said, oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, we have a, an American fellow who's, who's going and doing work in Cuba as well. So then that's how that developed. And then in 2006, the Lord said, okay, I want you to move to Alberta. To Calgary, Alberta, to where our Canadian office is. And I want you to take up the position, which I'm still doing today, as representing as promotion and recruitment director, the work of action in churches and Bible colleges and mission conferences across Canada. And so I moved to Alberta. It took two tries before I said yes, because I love Manitoba. Despite the cold and the mosquitoes, there's lots of good things in Manitoba. Um, and so I, I moved, but I didn't want to live in Calgary, so I had friends who had the bicycle apartments. They actually owned them for a few years, so I moved there. And I lived in the bicycle apartments for six years, and then I moved to Acme, where I've been ever since 2012, and so about 10, well, going on 11 years now, I've been in Acme at the... The Acme townhomes, which just changed owners as well. But uh, I love it in Acme, loved it in Bicecur. So that's kind of how I ended up where I am today. And we all have a unique story to tell about your journey of how you got where you are today. And like fingerprints, they are unique. I grew up with two brothers, but our life experience, even growing up together in the same family, was not exactly the same. We're different. Some of the, sure, some of the things we shared the same together, but other, many others were different. We have different life experience. And that's kind of what I want to share on this morning. And, and that's the title of my message. It's called Equipped and Ready to Serve the Gifts that Keep on Giving. Now, we just celebrated Christmas. And we got all kinds of gifts were given out over, over the Christmas holidays. <clears throat> And the question I ask sometimes is, how long do those gifts actually get used? You know, the tools and the toys and the video games and all the other things. How many of them keep getting used on a regular basis after three months or four months or a year? How many get broken and lost and, or people get bored with them? Nah, do I, whatever it is. But God has given each of us a host of gifts and abilities that continue to give year after year after year, actually for the rest of our lives. Some gifts were given to all human beings have certain gifts and abilities that God has given us. And he's given us other gifts and abilities that only followers of Christ have. And let me share a few of those. I'm going to go into everything. The fact is, we all have natural gifts and abilities. We were born with them. They could be athletic. They could be artistic. They could be academic, like math and sciences. They could be leadership gifts that you have, organizational gifts. The list goes on. We all have certain natural gifts and abilities that we were born with that we're good at to more or less degree. And that's the first kinds of gifts that we have and we all have them. If you're not sure what all you have, start making an inventory or ask people, you know, what kind of gifts do you think I have? Because sometimes they have a better idea what you're good at than you are sometimes. We all have, like I already mentioned, life experience. We have unique um, life, life of events that we've been through in our lives, the good things, the, the difficult things, the challenges, the joys, we, we go through experiences that are unique, that we can be used by God to bless others. For instance, my mother passed away when I was 23 years old from cancer. Five years she went through the process when it was first diagnosed to when she passed away. She knew the Lord, so I know I'm going to meet her one day. But God used the experience I went through dealing with my mother's illness 
and bed, being bedridden and in her death to help others. I began to meet people whose parent had died or was dying, and they were finding it difficult to deal with. And I was able to share from my own experience to help them understand and maybe help them handle their experiences better, their grief. Those are the kinds of things we all have them. God can use your life experience, your education. Everybody has an education. You have your, your public school education. Some of you have gone on to college, university. Some have done uh, vocational training. Some of you have businesses. You learn business. I mean, there are a few farmers around, isn't there? Well, your farm, it's a business, right? It could be a joy, but it's still a business. You have a store you run or whatever it is. You learn that's an education, learning apprenticeships or learning a trade or a business, how to run things. That's all part of your education. You all have it to some degree or another. If you're a homemaker raising children, <laughs> that's an education in itself. I mean, mom, my mom could tell you stories about raising us three boys, you know. But that is, is an education that you can pass on to other up-and-coming mothers, new mothers, young mothers, whatever. We all have those things. And, of course, God gave us all a mind, a mind to, to look at challenges or problems and come up with answers and solutions and be creative. We all have those things. Now, what are the things that God has given to us as his followers? And if you're not a follower, if you've never taken time to make Jesus Christ personal to your life and put your faith and trust in him. These areas are you're excluded from. But God wants you to have these abilities and gifts if you would trust your life over to him. And I encourage you to do that. The first is spiritual gifts. We're all familiar with spiritual gifts. We hear about them in the service. Every follower of Jesus Christ has at least one spiritual gift. And you say, well, what are they? Well, you need to look them up in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 11 has one list. There's a couple of different lists that Paul puts together. Gifts of preaching and healing and, and helps and mercy and, and all kinds of things like that. You all have one of those gifts. And if you don't know which gift or gifts you have, then you need to to find out. And again, people around you usually can pick up on those things. So ask those family or friends or others that you're close to know you well. I'm trying to figure out my spiritual gift. Do you, do you have an idea what it might be? Otherwise, of course, the Holy Spirit, who's an, which is another gift, we are all given the gift of the Holy Spirit. The moment we come to faith in Christ, he comes and dwells within us and he walks with us each and every moment of each and every day. <clears throat> we don't do what God wants us to do with our lives by ourselves. You know, God doesn't say, okay, here, here's the plan, go and do it. And I'm going to sit back and watch. No, he says, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit along with you to guide and direct you and to give you those extra things that you may need along the way that you don't have. But we all have a spiritual gift, and God wants us to use those spiritual gifts in whatever God has asked you to do. See, God doesn't equip us with all these things and not have something for us to do with it. So it's very important to realize that all of these different things I've been talking about, another gift that God has given us is the Word of God. Scriptures. They're there to guide and direct us as well, to teach us, to, um, to encourage us, sometimes to um, criticize us if we're not doing things the way we should, to keep us on the straight path, but also to give us answers to questions that we have. Every question in your life that you have that comes across your path, there is an answer either directly or indirectly in the scriptures. I've, I've been a follower of Christ for over 55 years, so I know from personal experience that that's true. Okay? I'm not a new person on the job or just saying it because somebody told me. I've seen from personal experience how the Word of God 
plus the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God has helped me to learn new things about how to live the Christian life, what God expects of me, how I should treat other people, how I should deal with certain things like, you know, death or tragedy or whatever it might be in a way that pleases him. And that is, that is the main goal of doing what God requires of us is to bring people to Jesus Christ first and also to bring glory to God, to make people know who God is and how they need to be thankful for what God has done in our lives and for who God is as God. You know, God is just not some spiritual individual up there in the, in the heavens looking down on us. He personally wants to be involved in our lives. He, doesn't, he wants to interact with you, to have a relationship with you. And God knows more about you than you do. Do you know how long you're going to live your life? How many days you have to live your life? God does. In Psalm 139, if you ever want to know how intimate God already knows you and wants to continue to be a part of your life, Psalm 139, that's one of my favorite psalms, even chapters in the Bible. doesn't matter where you go, the, that chapter says, doesn't matter where you are in the world, God is there. God knows every word you're going to speak before you speak it. He knows how many days you're going to live. In another, in another, in the New Testament talks about how God knows how many hairs are on your head. Now, unless you're bald and you don't have any hairs there, that's easy to count. But otherwise, if you have hair on your head, you, will you be able to count that? Well, God knows how many hairs are on your head. I mean, I mean, I thought, well, is that really important, God? To God it is. Otherwise, he wouldn't do it. But that's how important you are to him. That's how much he loves you and wants to be intimately connected in your life, if you will let him. You know, it's been said, and I don't know who said it, but I hear it lots, that 80% of what needs to be done in the church is done by 20% of the members in the, in the congregation. I don't know what that's like here in your church, but I know growing up in the churches I've been, the majority of people who come to church are not involved in some way in the church. They come on Sunday morning, they sit in the pew or a chair, uh, they listen to the message, they visit, and they go home. All of us have gifts and abilities where we should be using them in the church. You're a great mission-oriented, um, focused congregation. You have been for years. I just heard that this morning. Going overseas doing ministry here. You took in, a, I think, at least two refugee families in the recent years. You, you took, took them in, took care of them, helped them adjust to Canadian life and, and get them on their feet again in a, new, in a new place. That's mission. That's caring for people. You're doing it at home. You're doing it overseas. All of you have something you can do. You're never too old to do what God wants you to do. You're not too young to do what God wants you to do. Adriana um, was a young, a young girl, nine years old. This is a few years ago. She, at the age of nine, she was in her church, and there was someone sharing about the plight of orphans in Kenya. And so she decided, I want to do something to help those orphans, but what can I do? I'm nine years old. <laughs> she said, oh, I can swim. So she, with her parents, created a swimathon. And so she began to get sponsors for her swimathon. And on the appointed day, she went to an outdoor pool. She lived in Abbotsford, so I could do that, you know, uh, most of the year. And with the help of a paddleboard, she swam 87 laps of that pool, length of that pool, until she got tuckered out but she raised over $2,500 by doing that. But that's not the end of the story. She took the money, she sent it to an organization in Kenya that took care of orphans. The, the wife of the president of Kenya heard about what she did 
and the wife donated a matching amount. So Adriana in Abbotsford, BC, used her, her ability to swim, her joy of swimming, to raise over $5,000 for orphans in Kenya. And she'll never meet those orphans in Kenya, I'm sure. But she did it because God put something on her heart and said, I can do this. I can do something as a child. I remember meeting the mother of a seven-year-old in Vancouver at Vancouver Mission Fest a number of years ago who said, my seven-year-old son videotapes himself acting out Bible stories. He uploads them to YouTube and invites his friends and classmates to watch. Wow. I mean, young people, you're so, you know, tech savvy. There's so much that, that can be used. Seven years old. That's what he decided he could do with what he knew how to do it so that he could reach out to his friends and classmates. Wow. Russell Stendhal. I don't know if you ever heard of Russell Stendhal. He works with a mission called um, Cristo para Cuba, uh, Colombia, sorry, Christ for Colombia in Spanish. He's a second generation um, missionary. His parents started the mission. And in Colombia, there was a civil war going on for over 20 years with rebel groups. Lots of violence, lots of hundreds, thousands of people died and were injured. Others were displaced. And Russell wanted to reach out to the rebel groups with the gospel. He tried to do that in person, but four times he got kidnapped by rebel groups. Held for a while, and then God thankfully had him released. So he said, i got to find a different way to go into the areas with the gospel of where the rebel groups are holed up, in the jungles of Colombia, but I need to do it in a different way. So what can I do? Well, there's an organization in Ontario called GALCOM. GALCOM is an organization that produces resources, technological resources that missionaries can use to share the gospel. And one of the things, and I forgot to bring it with me this morning, I was going to have one at home, it's a solar-powered radio. <clears throat> this solar-powered radio is called a fixed tuned radio. What you do is you tell the company, uh, Galcom, when you order the radios of the frequency AM or FM of a, a Christian station in whatever country you're in, and they will tune the radio to that station and fix it so it can't be changed. And then you can then give these out to people and they can listen to Christian radio station programs and music on their solar-powered radio. Not only that, but there's memory in there, I think it's four gigabytes, where you can put um, audio, um, audio uh, resources on there, like the Bible, children's Bible stories, um, the Jesus film. There's thousands of resources in different languages, so you can have them add that in as well, so they can not only listen to the Christian radio station, but people can then listen to the Word of God, listen to Bible stories or sermons on their solar-powered radio as well. So Russell went to them, and he ordered thousands of these radios, had them all fixed-tuned and had uh, resources put on them. Then he had them uh, develop a parachute to attach to the radios had them shipped to Columbia. He got a whole bunch of bubble wrap. They bubble wrapped all the radios. They went up in an airplane and threw them out over the jungles where the rebel groups were. I think up to 30,000 radios over a base of several years. What was the result of his work? Up to, he said, I, I met him a few years ago in Edmonton at Mission Fest. He was speaking there. And he said, we estimate that 3,000 rebels came to faith in Christ from those radios. But that's not the end of the story either. A few years later, after he'd done this, the government and the rebel groups decided to have peace talks and bring a war, an end to the war, which eventually they did. And Russell was invited to be part of the peace talks because of his influence both to the rebel groups and in the eyes of the government. That was a man dedicated to use what he had 
but also what somebody else had for the purpose that he had been given by God to reach those rebels for Christ. And there are thousands of families today in Colombia who are now followers of Christ because of what Russell did. See, we can all do these kinds of things. So don't think that you don't have anything to contribute in your church. There's something you can do. Like I said, it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. It's a matter of, am I willing? Maybe this year you want to make a commitment. Don't make a resolution. New Year's resolutions don't usually work too well. But make a commitment with God to say, I am willing to commit to being surrendered and open to do whatever I can do to help this church be what it needs to be in this community. Whatever that is. And then start looking for opportunities to serve. Go to your pastor. Go to others in the church and say, you know, I'm good at this. I like to do that. Can I be used? Consider going overseas. If you have the health and, and the time, the holidays, take a few weeks and go overseas. We heard about people going to Ecuador and, and other places. Go for a few weeks. You have missionaries that you're I'm sure your church supports. Go and visit them. Spend a week or two with your missionary and see in person what they do. That will make their relationship to you much more uh, meaningful. They're not just a a name and a picture on the wall that we support them. Now we know who they are. There's all kinds of ways that we can do those things that God has called us to do. So take an inventory. Find out all these gifts and abilities, life experience, training, all that. You know, look, even list it all out if you want. How can I take all these things that God has given to me, equip me so I can go out and gift people in some way with my life to influence their life? Everyone who comes to faith in Christ does not do it in a vacuum. They usually do it because somebody influenced them in their life, or groups of people to come to faith in Christ. It's because of the influence of others. You can be an influence of others. I can be an influence of others. Uh, growing up, I was the shyest kid on, in, in my church, pretty much. Um, I, I, could, I could never come up and speak in public. But over time, God used me in my experiences to get over certain challenges so that I could do what down the road, God had me to do. You know, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. That's the most wonderful gift. Not by work, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God planned in the past for you to do. God's already planned these things for us even before you came to faith, probably even before you were born. God already had a plan for your life. He wants you to fulfill it, and you need to come to him and say, okay, how can I do that? What is it you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? Because God has given you what you need to accomplish that, and I've shared that. We are um, accountable for what God has given us. God, it, it's like the, the parable of the, of the master who was going away, what we call the parable of the talents, where he gave certain amounts of money to three servants, five talents, three, uh, two talents, and one talent, uh, or, a, or a mina, whatever. It was a, a certain amount of money, different amount of money to each of the servants, said, okay, I want you to invest that money while I'm gone. And when he came back, he said, okay, now, come on forward and tell me, what did you do with the money I gave you? The man with... With five talents says, I doubled your money. I've got ten talents here for you. The man with two talents says, I've doubled the money. I've got taken my two and I've given you four. Each of them was given great rewards and praise by, the, by their owner, uh, their master, for what they did. See, the, the guy with the four talents got just as praise as the guy with the ten talents. The guy with the one talent said, well, you're a, you're a kind of a rough character, so I just buried the money I was afraid I'd lose it, and then I'd get in trouble. And so he said, here's your one talent back. 
So he didn't use the talent that he was given. And he was punished for that. He said, you wicked servant, the master said. You could have at least taken it to the bank and got interest out of it. But you're only thinking of yourself. And so he even had that one talent taken away from him and given to the guy with the ten talents. See, we are accountable for how we use what God has given us. So use what God has given you to make God proud. You can say, you may not be as good as someone else in a certain area, but that doesn't matter. Use what God has given you at the level he's given you to touch other people's lives, to do what God has called you to do. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for this opportunity to share what you put in my heart to hopefully encourage each one that's here to see the things that you have given them, the gifts and abilities, uh, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, all those things, and then commit to finding ways to use those gifts and abilities to honor you and to touch other people's lives for you. That's all you ask of us. And then see what you will do with our lives when we are willing to go and be your servant. In Jesus' name, amen. These verses are from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, and this is important, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. So we're going to sing, uh, yet not I, but Christ through me. Why don't you stand?
you so much, Scott, for being here and sharing with us and that uh, rousing challenge to action. No pun intended. But uh, let's just close with a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much for all that you have given us, all the gifts and all the blessings and the, the life day by day that you have given us, Jesus. God, may we use this for your glory. May we give back to you everything that you have given to us in, in an act of worship. God, may we cast our count, crowns before your throne, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.